we have us a new Snow White trailer. <laughs> and the internet can't stop laughing. Why? We can't suspend our disbelief. Rachel Zegler is more beautiful than Gal Gadot. <laughs> I can't act so I cast. One of the core themes of Snow White is beauty. We have us a queen who is the most beautiful in all of the land. She has no equal, but she's getting older, and she's starting to feel like that her beauty is beginning to fade, and she ain't happy about that. It's easy to imagine. Every night, an older woman sitting at her makeup table frantically applying serums and creams. She looks in the mirror and she sees another gray hair, another wrinkle, and she's constantly needing affirmation. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror provides that affirmation. You are my queen. Ah, <sighs> Still the most beautiful in the land for another day. Father Time is undefeated. It was inevitable that the queen would eventually hear what she feared the most. She ain't the most beautiful in the land anymore. In most versions of the story, Disney's included, Snow White is the legitimate queen. She's supposed to take the throne once she comes of age. Not only will Snow White take the queen's political power, as she comes of age, she will become more beautiful than the queen. Not if I can help it. The green monster of jealousy rears its ugly head. You have a story about two world-class beauties. One, an older woman, just past her prime, her beauty beginning to fade. And a younger woman who's just reaching her prime, her beauty is in its full glory. For the story to work. For the audience to believe that a woman would become so jealous of another woman's beauty, she would be willing to murder her own stepdaughter, you have to cast two women that at the bare minimum, it can be argued, are of equal beauty. What does Disney go and do? They're trying to convince us that Gal Gadot, of all people, would be threatened by Rachel Zegler's beauty. What's the big deal, Randy? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. No, it's not that simple. There are four components that go into determining beauty. And this is true whether we're talking about a man or a woman. There is an objective, based on mathematics, element to beauty. There is an undefinable, unexplainable, but you know it when it's there, it factor to beauty. How much we like somebody has a huge impact on how we evaluate their beauty. And then there's personal preference, whether you like tall, short, slender, curvy, blonde, brunette, blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes. How does something that seems to be so personal, evaluating beauty, have an objective component? That's easy. Statistics. You take a row of rectangles and you start on the left with one that has a ratio of one to one, a square. The next one has a ratio of 1 to 1.1. The next one, 1.2. And you go all the way up to a ratio of 1 to 2. You then ask a thousand people to tell you which one of those rectangles they find the most aesthetically pleasing, the most beautiful. Those thousand people's answers will create one of the prettiest bell curves you have ever seen and it will be centered exactly on the ratio of 1 to 1.6. 1 to 1.6. Is that special? Something that we should care about in any way whatsoever? <laughs> you bet your stinky socks it does. It's the golden ratio. The foundation of the golden rectangle, the golden section, the Fibonacci sequence. Ah, geez, Randy, you people and your golden ratios. It doesn't mean anything. I'm not here to tell you what it means, but I am here to tell you it exists and it matters. You can't escape the golden ratio. It's everywhere, in nature, in art, and importantly for our topic today, in the human face and figure. Every single proportion of the human body falls into the golden ratio. The more you measure, the more you find golden ratios. The golden ratio is particularly important when it comes to the human face. The ideal face is based upon a complex relationship between multiple golden ratios. 
The closer the calculations for your face match the mathematical ideal, it becomes like that rectangle 1 to 1.6. Statistically, more people will think your face is aesthetically pleasing. They'll think you're beautiful. There are lots of examples from history. One of the best ones is a young Elizabeth Taylor. Not only is her face perfectly symmetrical, but it is said that her face's ratios are identical to the ideal. Do your tastes run a little more modern? Then check out Angelina Jolie circa early 2000s. No, honey, I'm not looking at pictures of beautiful women. I'm doing research. Like Elizabeth Taylor's, Angelina's face is symmetrical, and it comes very close to the ideal ratio. We all know the beauty scale, 1 to 10. And based upon how close our face matches the ideal, every single one of us has an objective point where we fall on that scale. But that's just the beginning in understanding how we evaluate beauty. The second element that goes into evaluating beauty is the it factor. Charisma, presence, force of personality, we don't know what it is, but we know when somebody has it, and more importantly, when somebody doesn't have it. I'm going to give you all two examples, one anecdotal, and the other one you will recognize right away. I have a friend that when you first meet her, she really doesn't stand out. She's a very attractive woman, beautiful face, amazing figure, at least an 8.5. But her personality, the way she dresses, nothing seems to draw attention to herself. I quickly noticed that every time I saw her in public, she was like a magnet drawing people to her. Men and women both were always trying to get her attention, and she was blissfully oblivious to her effect on everyone. My friend has it. Whatever it is, she has it. It's like she's rich, saturated, vibrant colors, and the rest of us are just muted pastels. You can't not notice her in a crowd. Now for an example y'all will recognize. Jack Nicholson is not a handsome man, but it's flipping Jack Nicholson. He oozes it. When Nicholson is up on the screen, even if it's a bad film and he's phoning in his performance, we still want to look. There's something about him that makes it hard to turn away. This mysterious it can cause our evaluations of somebody's beauty to leap way up. The more it somebody has, the less relevant their objective beauty becomes. The third component in evaluating beauty, how much do we like that person? It's often called the beauty bias. It's argued we are predisposed to like people we find beautiful. That's true in and of itself, but it's much more complicated than that. It's one of those, did the egg or the chicken come first debate? We find the people that we like more attractive. That scale, 1 to 10, the people we like, on average, we will move them up two points. We think our friends are attractive. So when we meet somebody new that we find beautiful, we tend to assume we like them. Turns out, human beings seem to have a built-in correlation between beauty and like. Beauty is a marker of good health and good genetics. So as a species, it makes sense that we would be wired to seek out and like beauty. It's great to be beautiful, right? Sure, it does have its advantages, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Never a free lunch. Beauty is a double-edged sword. Granted, the beautiful person oftentimes doesn't have to earn our like, but if they ever say or do anything that we find offensive, we take it personal, as if a close personal friend stabbed us in the back. For the same amount of like that we were willing to give out, we are now willing to give out the same amount of hostility. Old Hollywood well understood this phenomenon. That's why they created a fantasy world around their stars. They went out of their way to always present their stars as being as charming and likable as possible. A classic example of this is Clark Gable. By all accounts, not the nicest person around, and it is alleged one of the dumbest people to have ever come out of Hollywood. The old studio system controlled every aspect of Clark Gable's PR. Look, 
Clark Gable loves animals. Good people love animals. You love animals. So Clark Gable must be a great guy. They made sure to take full advantage of the beauty bias. Carol Lombard is beautiful. You like Carol Lombard. Well, Carol Lombard liked Clark Gable so much, she married him. So therefore, you should like Clark Gable. Clark Gable's heyday was the 1930s and 40s, a time of extreme suffering here in America. Most of Clark Gable's public appearances were pre-scripted. Old Hollywood understood very well that if Clark Gable did not show the right amounts of humility and gratitude for his privileged position in life, that he potentially faced pitchforks and torches. Old Hollywood knew the risks they were running. You manipulate the beauty bias at your own peril. Because if it goes wrong, <laughs> we finally come to the last component in evaluating beauty personal preference. Old Hollywood knew. Any image-based industry throughout history has understood this, but Old Hollywood knew we are all unique individuals with our own idiosyncratic likes and dislikes. There is somebody here on YouTube who has a voice identical to somebody I know and despise. I can't stand to watch their videos because their voice sounds like nails on a chalkboard. Because of my own unique life experience has caused me to have a very particular dislike, that person has lost me as a viewer by no fault of their own. Hollywood used to know there is no beauty that will appeal to everyone, so they used the shotgun approach. Throw as many types of beauty at the audience as possible. Last number of years, elements in Hollywood have been trying to change traditional beauty standards. And their argument can work up until a point. You ignore anything to do with objectivity. You emphasize the subjective personal preference. And then you intimidate and bully, bludgeon everybody into submission. They are making the argument, we find this person attractive, so therefore you should find this person attractive. If you don't, you're a horrible human being. Subjectivity. It factor, likability, personal preference can play such a large part in our evaluation of beauty, we're willing to suspend our disbelief. We're willing to say, that ain't my cup of tea, but who knows, maybe lots of people like that. Whatever, you do you. That argument doesn't work though when you begin to ask the audience to compare and contrast between two individuals' beauty. You're asking the audience to use their own judgment. And it turns out, humans are very good at evaluating the beauty between two individuals. Oftentimes, the quality of our children's lives hang on that decision. If the audience makes a decision that you don't like, and you try to intimidate and bully them, you're a bad person if you don't agree with us. The only response you're going to get? <laughs> the story of Snow White is all about comparing and contrasting two women's beauty. We as the audience have to be able to believe that Snow White's beauty would make the queen feel so threatened and jealous that she would be driven to attempted murder. Disney, in their infinite wisdom, cast Rachel Zegler as Snow White and then Gal Gadot as the evil queen. This don't add up. So let's do a little beauty analysis, shall we? Let's start with Rachel. Symmetrical, regular features. She's close to the ideal. Objectively, she's beautiful. I'd give Rachel a solid 8. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to be as fair as possible and as generous as possible. So we're going to say 8.5. Gal, on the other hand, I don't think I'm being very controversial when I say Gal Gadot is a world-class beauty. If somebody like a young Elizabeth Taylor is a 10, in my books, Gal Gadot is just not quite there. So I would give her a 9.5. Right off the bat, we have a problem. The woman portraying the queen is objectively more beautiful than the woman playing Snow White. Objective beauty is just the baseline, though. All that subjective stuff can change things around quite a bit. It factor. Gal Gadot has it. Charisma, sex appeal, whatever you want to call it, she has it. I think most people would acknowledge Gal is not a great actor, 
but she has that thing that still makes us want to watch her. Rachel doesn't have it, or if she has it, it doesn't translate to film. She's missing that spark. No worries, we still have likability. Likeability can make or break a uh-oh. Gal has her baggage. I got one word for you. Imagine. Now, to Gal's credit, she's come out and said that was a mistake. Gal comes off as not necessarily the sharpest knife in the drawer and a bit self-absorbed, but generally she seems personable, friendly, likable. If you could find a topic she's interested in talking about, you'd probably enjoy the conversation. Rachel? <laughs> We've all seen the interviews. When Rachel started lecturing the audience on morality, she came off as smug, entitled, ungrateful, and arrogant. The audience interpreted Rachel as saying, you know that movie you love that has the values you believe in? They're evil. I'm going to be in a movie that's going to teach you the right values. Watch my movie, peasants. Give me your money while you're at it. We're willing to like somebody just because they're beautiful. The trade-off, if they attack us, things, ideas that we value, we take it personal. Remember, our evaluation of somebody's beauty can go up or down the beauty scale on average two points based upon how much we like or dislike somebody. That means Rachel has dropped from an 8.5 to a 6.5. But I would argue that Rachel's comments were so antagonistic that most people would now evaluate her under a five. The casting could have worked. Their objective beauty is close enough that if Rachel had had a buttload of charisma or whatever it is and came off as likable, charming, sweet, kind, somebody the audience would have wanted to root for, she could have become a 10. It would be believable that Gal could become threatened by somebody with that combination of physical beauty, charisma, and likability. After Rachel's antics, comments, a large percentage of the audience now thinks she's a five at best. The gap between her and Gal's perceived beauty is way too wide. The story no longer works. It's no longer believable. Good old Rachel just can't keep her yap shut. She keeps throwing fuel on the fire. The trailer for Snow White drops. And at first, Rachel makes a very PR-friendly post on X. Thank you for the support. I love everybody. Off to my next project. Talk to you later. And then just like somebody who sticks their head back in the door after just walking out of the room to scream one last insult, she throws out an incendiary comment. The question I have... Why did Rachel feel the need to make that incendiary comment within the context of her previous post about Snow White? It makes you wonder if it's Rachel who's jealous and threatened by Gal's beauty. Live action Snow White, it's done. There's nothing Disney, Rachel, Gal, or anybody can do at this point to save that movie. What Rachel doesn't seem to realize yet her career is done as well. When people take things personal, they develop very long memories. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.